Good afternoon, one and all. Let me check my sounds going. Yes, it is. That's always a twitchy moment. I'm never sure. With me, oh, by the way, I'm James. Nice to meet you. Hello. Uh, with me today, I have Marta. She's in the background. She's never likes being on camera. Marta. No. Marta is my amazing assistant. She's going to respond to all of your queries during the session this afternoon. If you've got a question, if you've got a comment, put it into the uh, the live chat on the Hub page. If you're watching us on YouTube, click in the description below. Take to the Hub page, same session, and there's a live chat available there. We switched off YouTube chat. Ooh, you know, we want to do it that way. It's sort of accessible, but it gets a bit silly. So we turn that off. Um, furthermore, folks, if you are on YouTube or indeed on the Hub page, please, from our hearts, give us a like. Do give us a sub as well. It's really helpful for the channel. We're up to about 11,500 subscribers. We're quite proud of that. But basically, as subscribers get bigger, but you get more sort of like opportunity from YouTube. So give us that let us have it and we'll serve it to you. We'll give you good stuff, hopefully. Now, the session today, you ideally will have a bunch of resources with you. They're all available on the Hub page there. You should have them already. But ideally, you'll have the notes pages. They will help a lot in this session. Secondly, you should have access to the National Mock Exam, answered or not. That's up to you. The model answers and the mock schemes that go with that. And do have the infographics somewhere to hand. Those resources will really help you to decipher this paper one exam, which is a toughie, let's be honest. So... That's what we're going to focus on. We anticipate the session being, well, absolute maximum of about an hour and 25 minutes because we're doing AQA at five o'clock. So we've absolutely got to be done with them. But we reckon between an hour and 10 to an hour and 15 minutes is pretty much where we'll be. So get comfy. Your pen's going to be smoking. I make no apology. I'm going to go at some pace here because we're covering a lot in that time period. You can always come back and reflect on it and return to the session as you need to, folks. Also, the things that are in the notes pages there, the images you're going to see on the screen, there's so much sort of quality and value to those themselves. Um, do consider using it. Marta, have I forgot anything? Can I get onto the canvas? Can I get yeah. me headphones on ready to go? Yeah. We can crack on. <coughs> we can crack on. So folks, yeah. oh, we love a shout out. So you know, he wants James to shout him out on YouTube. I don't know, but someone might. And we do, I think we've already got one, haven't yeah, we? Yeah, we do have one. We've got one already. We'll do that at the end. But if you want to, if you want to share us a photo on social or anything like that, anyone's to, you know, let us know. Let us know if you're in a classroom stuff and we'll mention you at the end. And it's just nice interactions. They're just community. Wonderful. Right, I'm going to go for it, Marta, unless you tell me otherwise. I'm going to get my headphones on, digital pen ready. And otherwise, we're going to have a go at this. Let's change stream. So let's do this, shall we, folks? A couple of things to begin with. Obviously, we're focusing specifically on paper one. You don't need me to talk you through that. What I do want you to be aware of, though, is whether you're taking the session live, that might be trickier to get one, but I'd say, oh, definitely, if you're taking this on demand, you really should have the notes pages. If you're not on the hub page, get yourself on that, and they are the all the notes are there for you, okay? So it goes along with the session specifically rendered down for what I'm about to go through. Um, on that hub page, we have the notes of the session, we have the exam infographic, which you really should study. We have the national mock exam, the national mock exam mark scheme, and the national mock exam model answers. That, in terms of preparation for your paper one, is critical, folks. If you are not using that material, with respect, you are not preparing for this assessment. So get yourselves on there. It's utterly free. Just download it. Get on there. If you're on the YouTube clip, or if you're on the YouTube on Catch Up or indeed live, you can just go to the description, take you straight to the hub page, everything there. Now, you'll also notice once you get to your notes that we have uh, performed profiles. We've got Josh, we got Tom, we got Kate, we got Laura, we've got Julie, and we've got Carlos. Okay, now the idea of these performer profiles, and I will reference them during this session, but every time we look at a piece of material in the session, you can go, right, how does that apply to Laura? Laura is a performer who undertakes maximal performance. It's typically anaerobic, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, where you could be saying, okay, with Tom, it is typically sub-maximal performance, but it's games and it involves sort of uh, dynamic movement. And it's generally aerobic, but it's also got, I'll put aerobic, it's got some anaerobic work in there as well. Now, everything we go over today, you can start applying to different uh, different performances from those. So there, those are there. And lastly, folks, before we fly into this, this is what my materials cover for 2023. Can I be clear, folks? This is covered in its entirety in the National Mock Exam, the Associated Mark Scheme, and the Model uh, Mark Schemes and the Model Answers I've provided. In this session, where we've got 90 minutes, I'm going to cover analysis of movement. Uh, this, 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 this. Now, I think we can all agree that is a hell of a chunk for an hour and a half. So the other parts there. You can go and have a look at those directly via the exam, directly via the model answers. Can I stress as well, there is other material which is neither on the mock exam uh, or in the session 
but, but could be on your exam, right? So make sure you're covering everything, but this is what I'm focusing on. And I think it's a hell of an effort for 90 minutes. Oh, by the way, with that in mind, folks, we are going to go today at real pace, okay? So it may be that you actually have to watch this bit twice, you know, watch it live and then go back to it, for example, because I'm going to go through at a bit of a lick, basically. All right, section one, analysis of movement. Folks, you saw up here, analysis of movement is worth 24 marks between... 2018 and 2022 and you can see that breakdown here you can see every year it is assessed sometimes more marks sometimes fewer sometimes AO2 sometimes AO3 I actually put this on the screen just to show you that if you actually look here folks that is those 24 marks that we acquire in each of the, those years so what we can say for analysis of movement for sure is that it's a really reliable way if you get good at this to guarantee yourself some solid marks now obviously you'll notice what I'm talking about in my sessions, I'm doing hip, knee, and ankle, lower body. Can you notice that, for example, shoulder has never been assessed? Now, I'm not gonna go over shoulder today, I might mention a couple of bits, but do prepare yourself for that. Could it be elbow again? Very possibly, folks, make sure you cover that. I am just happen to be choosing these three because they seem to be a little more lightly assessed, especially the hip, which is interesting. With that in mind, let's jump straight in. We've got a question. I'm gonna teach directly from questions here, folks. We've got a question. Look at this image, fantastic. Analyze the landing phase on the box by completing the table. So notice landing phase and these arrows are communicating. They're telling us things, folks. This is as this performer lands onto that box, onto that box top. So what does that mean? Well, first of all, let's go through our actual answers. What type of joint is the hip joint? Well, we know it's a ball and socket, so that's nice and simple. We can put that in there. Um, what joint movement? Well, if the hip is moving here in front of the body, we know that that is flexion. So we can put flexion there. Fantastic. But here's the critical, crit critical bit. What is the actual agonist muscle? Okay. Now, normally when we get flexion of the hip, of course, we think about hip flexors, the iliopsoas muscles, right? The iliacus and the psoas muscle. However, this is an eccentric contraction of a muscle because this is the downward action. Remember, landing, downward action. These are going to be eccentric contractions. So the agonist in this case is actually the gluteus maximus. Get your mind around that. We must be able to recognize the differences between a, let's call it a concentric and an eccentric contraction. Now, I've left all the space as well for the knee joint. Let's go through. We know it's a hinge joint. That's nice and simple. Hopefully, you don't need to tell you that. We also can notice that the hinge joint here is in a flexed position. So we've got flexion in terms of the joint movement. Fantastic. And again, it's a downward landing action. So we know it's going to be an eccentric contraction. Flexion is normally caused by the three hamstrings, the semimembrane, the semitendinosus, bicep femoris. But here, of course, the breaking action is produced by the quadricep muscles. So I'm going to choose one of those and say the vastus. And I'll put the lateralis, okay? The vastus lateralis. So there we go. So those are my answers in that particular case. That is the skill we need from you folks. Let's take it a bit further. I've got another example here. Now, we've got no question here. So we actually don't know what we're being told. Just given an image, and it's just a bit of a, like a worksheet, a task, right? So I'd like you to think, is this person moving? Are they settling down? Are they still? And I'm going to assume they are still. And I'm actually going to make a deliberate error here, and I'll see if you can spot what it is. So this person is still. They're in a, well, first of all, we can say what kind of contraction. We know this is going to be an isometric, don't we? Because it's going to be stillness in balance. We'll come back to that. But here we go. It's telling me at the ankle, what are the articulating bones? Well, first of all, we've got three. We've got the tibia. We've got the fibula, please don't confuse those. And we've got one of our uh, tarsal bones, the talus, which is the, the upper tarsal bone that articulates the ankle. What kind of movement of this is this? Well, the sort of the, if we look here, the toes have been kind of raised towards the shin here. So I think it's fair to say that that's dorsi flexion. By the way, everything I see, dorsi flexion is one word, plantar flexion is two words. That, um, that little, uh, what's it called? <laughs> that little dash there is only because I didn't have space right. Dorsi flexion, one word. Now, what is the agonist? Now, I'm going to say dorsi flexion, the agonist is the tibialis anterior. And I'm going to say to you, now find the error in my answer. And I'll just sort of spend a bit of time maybe in a classroom chatting to your mates, chatting to teacher. What's the error? What's the error? Oh, I'm not sure. The error is, folks, that all isometric contractions are controlled by at least two muscles. So actually, this would be an isometric contraction of the tibia is anterior and the gastrocnemius. And that's where, of course, because it's been held still, right? Both, in essence, both are the agonist. I'm not sure you're going to get a question of that difficulty. 
they difficulty they tend to show motion in the main not always so just bear it in mind okay another really tough one this and we're looking at the hip okay so this time we're asked for both sides of the body and it's the left and the right obviously the front and the back and it's all about the hip so left side so that's this leg here let's get rid of that little line in case we need some drawing there what uh, kind of joint movement is that well if the hips in front of the, the legs in front of the body that folks darker color james that folks is flexion nice and simple what would be the agonist now we are told in the downward contraction okay this is the downward motion so we know that this is going to be an eccentric contraction because it's been acting as a brake slowing the descent down so what's the agonist again exactly like we said before gluteus maximus okay so it's really important we can stress that when the hip is being decelerated in its forward motion, its flexion motion, the gluteus maximus is acting as an uh, isotonic eccentric contraction. Now, on, on it helps us out because the right back leg, we've got it that it's extended, that the, uh, the hip flex, the iliopsoas, they're working. Of course, if it's an extended hip, iliopsoas normally causes flexion. So by definition, this has to be eccentric. Once again, just a little word there. Can you notice that on this one here, flexion, flexion, on this one here eccentric eccentric don't be afraid don't think oh, I must have it wrong I must put concentric it's really quite possible that they'll ask you for multiple uh, where you get a repetitive answer okay so just bear that one in mind now we'll do one more here C complete the table to analyze the long jump takeoff action at the ankle so we're interested in the ankle specifically is the takeoff meaning they're going upwards of course so what have we got here let's have a look so the type of joint sometimes people get this wrong folks the ankle is a hinge joint. Let's have that super clear. Secondly, what kind of movement? Well, we can see that the toes are pointing away from the shin. So that has got to be our two words of plantar flexion. Beautiful. And what's the agonist? Well, it's agonists in this case. You, of course, can have gastrocnemius, which is going to be contract. Let's see if I can spit, uh, get it in here, which is contracting concentrically. But you can also have the soleus muscle. And if you want, folks, you can just notice that this muscle here is the gastrocnemius. This muscle here is the soleus. You actually see both defined on this particularly muscular, what I think is man's leg, could be wrong. Okay, now, just to finish off this, folks, I just want you to have a look at this example. This is the same that we did right at the start. And I just wanted to show you a bit of like exam technique here. Notice in the command, complete the table. That's a very easy command, but it tells us landing, hip, and knee and the performer is still in the downward motion so if they do um what's it called embolden or highlight words for you that is communicating for you now i'm not going to repeat that same analysis because we've already got it but that means something to us and we must look out and must attend to that work okay i'm just going to pause for the briefest of seconds i'll just hold that there pause brief for seconds and we'll be straight back let's continue looking a little bit this time of the vascular system so a couple of things i want to stress that this actually repeats in many of the topics we look at you guys need to understand what we're going to do in relation to rest in relation to exercise and i'll put a little i'm not sure what i did there exercise i'm going to put a little asterisk by this one here and also in relation to recovery so we're going to cover all three of those stages in relation to redistribution of blood and venous return can i just stress sometimes exercise on the specification is split into max and sub max exercise and we will actually talk about this a little bit later on so just be looking out for those distinctions to go through questions now what's this topic all about redistribution of blood i reckon there's loads of you think you've got this absolutely nailed down for me i just want to get to the intuition of it this is all about prioritization in an essence if you you know think back to your gcc biology or those of you doing an a level you're in the thick of it right now you know that multicellular organisms human beings they have to, uh, their, their surface area to volume ratio, I'm probably bringing back some nightmares here, they, they mean that you have to have like delivery networks within the body, right? And that's what we're talking about here. So the body has to prioritize where it delivers nutrients to. And we're obviously we're talking about things like glucose, think about things like oxygen, we're talking about things like lipids or, or um, glycerol and fatty acids broken down from lipids. Right, what, where are these resources sent to and why? So let's look at this at rest. First of all, our Q, our cardiac output at rest can be estimated to be in the region of five liters. Don't believe me? Multiply 70 beats per minute 
by 70 milliliter stroke volume and you're going to get 4.9 liters or round it up five liters okay so we've got about five liters of cardiac output and what we're saying is as we're all sitting down right now maybe mine's slightly higher because i'm teaching and all that but about 80 percent of that about 80 percent of that is shooting off to the other organs right so it's going to the liver it's going to the brain it's going to the uh it's going to the stomach you know blah blah kidneys etc etc and only a fifth of that blood, and sometimes we say as high as, we sometimes say as little as 15% and as high as 85%, by the way, sometimes. But a smaller proportion of this is going off to your skeletal muscle. This is the muscles in your neck that have tone uh, to create tension and posture in your body, your lower back muscles, your core muscles that are holding you up. These are receiving this. And of course, they're receiving that because they need those resources for, amongst other things, aerobic respiration. So because aerobic respiration is going on at rest in greater quantities in other organs, the majority of the blood goes there. But what happens when we start exercising? Well, lo and behold, folks, we get a shift. We get a shunt. And what happens here is the following. We over a period of time first of all our cardiac output increases we've estimated 20 liters but it can be as high as 40 in really really highly trained individuals aerobic performers and what we're saying here now is that we have a switcheroo in the region of 80 percent of blood is redistributed to the skeletal muscle and leaving about 20 percent of blood going to other organs but those other organs generally speaking do not receive less blood now i'm not going to get the calculator out to prove this to you because of course 20 percent of 20 liters is still a significant figure compared to the 80 percent from five you can go and calculate the exact differences and etc and do it that way now how does this switcheroo occur so these are the key components first of all we need to recognize this word here and this term here an arterial folks is essentially a small artery and that artery if i was just to draw it here there's its lumen the gap in the middle and around that arterial there is a layer of smooth muscle now this smooth muscle can move in and constrict the lumen vasoconstriction or it can relax and increase the size of the lumen okay now we call those things vasoconstriction vasodilation let's notice what's happening we're talking about maximal exercise here arterials leading to the working muscles let's say it's to kate's legs as she pumps the pedals on the bike in the triathlon they vasodilate so that lumen opens and becomes larger whereas over here i'll come back to this side also pre-capillary sphincters now i'll do a terrible drawing here folks let's imagine you've got an arterial leading here and that arterial leads into a network of capillaries at the muscle here okay what we're saying is that you have muscles which surround each of these capillaries and they're called pre-capillary sphincter muscles and when they constrict down it prevents or, cr or creates resistance to blood th flow through that area so two what we get here is we get vasodilation and an opening of the lumen of the arterioles we get pre-capillary sphincters opening up and allowing less resistance to flow and the capillary bed at the capillary bed at the muscle is then flooded and flushed with oxygenated blood that should make sense so these muscles open the lumen widens because the diameter of the lumen increases because the we got phase dilation of the of the muscle around the arteriole but on the other side let's say of blood moving to the let's just say liver for argument's sake blood going to the liver what are we finding well vascular shunt occurs i'm going to come back to that term so what happens blood is shunted through the central capillary so exactly like i said over here folks blood is kind of shunted now just through one capillary and then out the other side of the capillary bed at the liver at the liver arterioles leading to other organs they constrict the lumen gets smaller increase resistance to flow and the pre-capillary sphincters the muscles i mentioned earlier these also contract or constrict causing more resistance to flow and less blood to go through so what we're saying here then is that happens because of those processes okay now there's a little term i want to add to you here and it's called vasomotor tone and it's a tiny little phrase doesn't really matter massively but vasomotor tone really directs and causes us to understand what vasodilation and vasoconstriction is this muscle here when it constricts in is increasing its vasomotor tone this muscle when it kind of relaxes outwards like this 
and creates the loom because the lumen to open up that is a decrease in the vasomotor tone and coming back to our other areas of study the vasomotor control center controls the level of tone i'm not going to touch on that more today but that's a nice little point just to make there now i've got to quickly change my ca uh, canvas and we're just going to look at uh, vascular shunting and redistribution during recovery so as i mentioned a few moments ago we also need to look at this process during recovery so of course what we're saying here is that as recovery happens we go from that sort of 20 liters of blood you know this was about 20 we said earlier it starts to reduce down to about five liters of blood as card of cardiac output but during that process as cardiac output reduces also the blood is redistributed back to the other organs in greater proportion and it's distributed away from the muscles in lesser proportion of that smaller quantity so we effectively get a reversal so what you'll see here folks is that and that have effectively switched around. Now, I'm not going to bore you too much by taking you through everything, but the same principle applies. We have got muscles surrounding those arterioles, which are either constricting inwards to cause constriction, increase vasomotor tone, or they're relaxing outwards to cause dilation, a decrease in vasomotor tone. Or, as I mentioned before, we've got our pre-capillary sphincters which as this capillary bed opens up like this, let's say let's say this is towards the liver again now, those pre-capillary sphincters open and loosen and now allow blood flow to pass through in greater proportion, hence getting that redistribution. Now that is what we call as a total vascular shunt. I wanna be specific about the term vascular shunt actually. You'll notice that to the muscle now, we get, we get uh, let me go let me find it for you here uh, what we find here is that the blood is shunted through the central capillary so once these sort of start closing off because let's say this is the muscle now it leaves one capillary or the central capillary open for blood to pass through and by the muscle efficiently quickly but of course with high resistance as we've said before okay let's move things on we're going to go straight into venous return now folks in many ways i simply give you this table and say look get on with it right you've got to learn that basically but i just want to make a couple of points one of the things we want to be considering is which of these are of relevance during activity now i'm sure you can tell me well james look if somebody does something like an active cool down that is going to help with their skeletal muscle pump, right? Because veins run through skeletal muscles. Therefore, if we keep contracting those muscles post-exercise or jog back into position, perform an active cool down, it's going to maintain that skeletal muscle pump. Can I remind you that venous return is, is the quantity of blood returning to the heart. And it's absolutely critical to us because our stroke volume is directly proportionate to our venous return. So that which comes back, venous return, is that which goes out, stroke volume. There's a couple of little details in that, but that's the principle. So skeletal muscle pump is heightened during exercise. Respiratory pump, which is the change in pressure of the thrust cavity, increases with exercise. Pocket valves, however, they do not increase with exercise. They're just dealing, they're, me they're mechanic mechanically operated. They're just dealing with more blood. Smooth muscles within veins, they do increase their activity because they pulse and constrict and relax and constrict, and they do that more and more forcefully during exercise. Gravity does not increase with exercise. So we can manipulate gravity. So for example, if a performer is cooling down, they can lie on their back and have their um, a teammate say, sort of shake their, shake their legs out and get you know the legs above the heart. That can be done. Elevated leg shakes sort of here. And also we've got general here, venous return is the volume blood returns to the right atrium, Starling's law, stroke volume equals venous return. So venous return is critical because it is the dictator of stroke volume. And that material on there, folks, is critical. Please notice application, 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 application. This needs to be applied. You say how people uh, maintain or, or increase their venous return. Okay, I'm just going to take the briefest of pauses just to sip my tea. So a really big topic this for us. And look, I'm going to be honest, this is something that I've found so frequently that students don't either understand well enough or don't write well enough about, hence me including in this session. Before we get started with this, can I just stress that everything I talk about is really kind of detailed down here for you. We're going to have a look at exchange during recovery to add to that table in a moment. But just to stress that point, folks, again, we're looking at gas exchange at rest, during sub-max exercise, max exercise, 
and also recovery. So let's see if we can get the main principles down here, then we can start applying it. First of all, get your labeling right, folks. This here is an alveolus. Now, because we are doing biology here, notice I'm not using any arrows. This here, this is a capillary. Now, we are to, we've represented it as a single capillary here. Of course, there'd be many capillaries, many, many alveoli. But of course, we've got the membranes between those things. And I just want to stress, those membranes are partially permeable membranes. Now, again, you biologists, or maybe just reflecting on your GCC studies, you biologists will probably know this, well, I'm sure you do know this far better than I. We're not going to get into channels, we're not going to get into any other process, but here, we're not getting into pumps in membranes, we're just going to look at the partially permeable membrane and the movement of gases by diffusion. And ultimately, folks, this is what we need to understand, that diffusion is occurring. So absolutely critical word, which is going into every single one of your answers, folks, is that gas exchange occurs via diffusion. So let's just see if we can get the basic premise of this. So first of all, I want you to criticize this image over here, especially if you're a biologist. You'll notice our red blood cells got lots of space in this capillary. No, our red blood cell here would absolutely fill our capillary there. Seven micrometers, exact, di exact diameter of the capillary itself. That's what our red blood cell would be the size of. Nevertheless, let's move on. Our red blood cell, as it arrives at the alveolus, what do we notice about it? It has a high concentration it has a high concentration of CO2. So it has a high partial pressure of CO2. It's carrying CO2 with it, right? Whereas in the alveolus, CO2 levels are really low. So here, we've got a low conch or concentration of CO2. However, what we also have, if I choose a green color here, in, in the alveolus, we have a high concentration of oxygen. It's molecular oxygen, so O2. And of course, on this red blood cell, we have a low concentration of, <laughs> of molecular oxygen, O2. So, of course, what we've now got, folks, is we've got a concentration gradient, or you could describe it as a diffusion gradient. So for both carbon dioxide and oxygen, we have a concentration or a diffusion gradient. So in essence, what's gonna happen here? Well, first of all, our CO2s are gonna diffuse across the membrane not all of them but they're going to diffuse across the membrane and they're going to do so um to, they're going to do that and by moving down the concentration gradient okay down the concentration gradient. and if you think about what diffusion is remember you know hopefully it's not bringing back nightmares to your gcc biology it's the net movement of gases down the concentration gradient from high concentration to, to low so we've got a net movement this time of carbon dioxide from the blood into the alveolus We've also got a net movement of oxygen molecules from the alveolus onto the red blood cell, where, of course, it associates with hemoglobin, Hb, and becomes HbO2, oxyhemoglobin. That, in essence, folks, is how our process is taking place. Now, can I stress to you folks, I've talked about a net movement of gases numerous times now, and this is a really important sort of intuition for you to get, even though it's sort of late in our studies, just before the exam. Net movement means, and just to be clear on this, just so in case anyone's confused, there is CO2 going in that direction and CO2 coming in this direction. It's moving everywhere. The point is, because there's more of it here, more of it moves in that direction. It is the net movement. And of course, we get that in the reverse for the oxygen. Now, this is how we're going to represent it. At rest, the process of diffusion, net movement of gases, down the diffusion or concentration gradient from high to low pressure across a partially permeable membrane. Magnificent. Oxygen moves from a high concentration alveolus to low capillary carbon dioxide the other way around. Brilliant. How do we get our marks for submaximal? Well, it's all about our quantifiers, folks. I want, I want, please give me quantifiers okay don't know why i said it like that increased diffusion gradient compared to rest greater quantities of oxygen even lower concentration of the capillary greater quantities of carbon dioxide even higher um, concentration in the capillary and uh to low concentration in the alveolus so these are quantifiers how do we take that now from to maximal exercise well we simply add further increased Yet even greater, yet even, folks, this, believe it or not, is the technicality of this topic. That is going to get you marks. If you just say, for, let's say, submax exercise, diffusion, no marks. Increased diffusion, greater rate of diffusion. 
that's where the mark's going to be. Now, if we go to our dura and recovery phase here, folks, I mean, we can do all kinds of things here, can't we? Um, we can start to think about, <coughs> excuse me, we can start to think here about all kinds of things. So we could say, for example, um, gradual decrease in, I'll, I'll put, just put in gradient, notice my quantifier. And then in essence, folks, we take these statements and we flip them. We flip them. And I'll give you a few moments to go about actually doing that in your own in your own notes. Noting you must use your quantifiers to get your marks. Okay, let's move on to energy systems. Now I'm going to go through uh, the details of the ATP PC system in a few moments' time. But first of all, can I just remind you, even though we're not doing this, about um, the concept of the energy continuum. So what we have here is the energy continuum okay now the energy continuum is defined as um, the relative contribution of energy by all three systems based on intensity and duration but what we're talking about here specifically is this ATP PC system okay folks so what do we need to know it's very high intensity more of which in a second it endures about 10 seconds it recovers 50% in 30 seconds and fully into three minutes and our work relief ratio is one to two. Now, again, you can study that material as much as you want, but what I want to do is I want to bring it down to our energy continuum graph. And of course, this graph shows us how energy is contributed across all three systems. And the intuition is the following. All three systems give energy, and of course we mean release or transfer. They give energy all the time. So there is no time during exercise where we are only using the phosphocreatine system. There is no time where we're only aerobic. If I take any point on this graph and go upwards, all three systems are contributing, just one's contributing more than the other two, right? So let's look at our ATP PC system. It's the green line. It shouldn't actually go up there, by the way. But if we notice, it comes down and kind of exhausts about this point. Now we've got that, what? I suppose it'd be 11, 12 seconds, about 10 seconds, and then it flattens out and contributes very, very little, what, round about sort of 8, 9% of energy as a total. So what we're finding here is that our ATPPC system, this is enduring, as we've said, that 10 second period in essence. The other point I want to draw out for you is it's got a threshold here. This is a threshold point. And we can say specifically at 10 seconds there, okay, threshold point, that lactic acid or the glycolytic system becomes predominant of the three above the phosphocreatine system. So that's really important we stress that. Now, let's make sure we understand what process is going on here first of all. We first, to understand this, need to stress what happens with ATP once we start moving, what's happening all the time actually. So ATP, adenosine triphosphate, in the presence of the active enzyme ATPase is broken down into adenosine diphosphate and the release of uh, it, inorganic phosphate okay so we've got a p that's been released now in that process energy is released and can be now transferred to the kinetic energy store it can be used for movement to power let's say tom serve in tennis uh to power uh what's his name josh's sprint start that energy can go be used for that uh, movement but we've got a problem we need to take this adp and we need to rebuild it how do we do that well first of all present in the muscle and specifically in the sarcoplasm, we have phosphocreatine. Now, in the presence of phosphocreatine and with falling ATP levels, this triggers creatine kinase, which is our active enzyme, and that breaks phosphocreatine into phosphogen and creatine and the release of energy. Now, I'm going to come back to energy in a second. Now, notice what we're going to do is we're now going to donate this phosphogen. So, our ADP from up here, whoop, our phosphogen from here, burp. notice our energy from here, burp. you put those three things together, what do you get? You get ATP, and that cycle can continue, continue. Now, I'm going to tell you in a second, there's no byproducts from this system. There's no harmful byproducts. Now, you might be looking at that and thinking, hang on, James, there's stuff left over. And I would just, I'm just going to pose a thought, and I'll answer it at the end. What do you think happens with this leftover, this and this during recovery? What do you think might happen? I'll leave that thought with you just for a second. So what do we have? We just want to do an analysis, first of all, fuel source of the ATP PC system. Well, we have got phosphocreatine, phosphocreatine or creatine phosphate. Either way is absolutely fine. 
The controlling enzyme is not ATPase, it's creatine kinase. That's our controlling enzyme. Our yield, that's an S, <laughs> our yield is one to one. Why? Because for every one PC, we get one ATP. And that ATP, again, as you see here, can be used for energy release and that energy can power movement. So we've got one to one byproducts, none except what we said before a hangover inorganic phosphate, a hangover creatine molecule. Of course, those two combine to restore phosphocreatine during recovery, as you're sure you've just guessed. But the type of, type of reaction here is we've got what's called a coupled reaction. Okay, and this is a really important point. So we had an exothermic re reaction here, the release of energy. That energy is then used endothermically to reform ADP. And therefore, this is a coupled reaction. The products of one reaction are used in a subsequent reaction. This is a coupled reaction. Now, one of the things we must be able to do is evaluate our energy systems. Okay, so what are the strengths and weaknesses? And you might want to think about these in relation to our different performers we mentioned right at the top. So first of all, all reactants, chemical term, chemistry students tell the others if they need it, all reactants in the cell. So we've got ATP, we've got uh, creatine phosphate, we've got creatine kinase, it's all in the cell, all in the sarcoplasm. Secondly, there's no delay, that's almost the same point, no delay for oxygen because we don't need oxygen here. We've also got up arrow, high intensity energy, blinking brilliant, fantastic. Furthermore, we've got no fatiguing byproducts. So those are our advantages of that system. But there are downsides, folks. What are they? Our weaknesses are as follows. First of all, we've got a low energy yield. Now, you've probably studied the aerobic, I hope you have, the aerobic system, and you probably know it's up to 1 to 38 um, moles of ATP. Um, so this is really low. And also, the other weakness here is its short duration. Now, folks, you can model out exactly what I just talked about in relation to any of our performers for any of those three systems. Those skills, I've shown you evaluation, I've shown you analysis. I've shown you here effectively the biology of the process. I mean, we skip over quite a bit. And also its relationship to other systems. Folks, if energy systems comes up, whether it's ATP, PC or one of the others, that ultimately is going to be what, you're, uh, what you are asked about. I'm just going to sip my tea just briefly straight back because we've got to get on with this. So folks, let us move into some ex-phys, some exercise physiology. I'm really going to, I think, whiz through this particular section of diet and nutrition because I think ultimately all the information is on the, the notes for you. And look, the bottom line is you just need to you, you need to get stuck into it. Let me just pluck, uh, pluck out a couple of key elements of this. Obviously, look at your carbohydrates as the as the predominant energy provider. Just bear in mind that, okay, fats are a smaller proportion of our diet, but fats do actually provide a very, very um, energy-rich source. You see here, slow digesting, but energy-rich. So that's actually really good for low-intensity work. Think about, you know, like uh, hill walking. Um, Tom was a recreational tennis player member, so it could be some of the aspects of his play. But a couple of things about uh, carbohydrates, first of all. Stored in the muscle and liver in the form of glycogen. Ultimately, it's a, it's a polymer broken down into the monomer. The, and of course, this is a monosaccharide, a single sugar broken down to glucose. And it is the source for both the glycolytic and the aerobic system. And it can go for about two hours if we are exercised for longer than that. Think road cycling, think about cage triathlon, um, think about tournament netball over the course of a day for Julie. You're going to need to restore this. Now, um, things about proteins. Now, proteins are so complex, folks. If you're doing biology, you don't need me to tell you. I'm not going to go into the detail. But key things I want you to be aware of here. Growth repair, therefore, they're crucial for the adaptation process. Therefore, even though they provide a small amount of energy, that's not that relevant. We want the amino acids, which in the ribosomes re we use to rebuild human proteins, such as muscle tissue. So if we take things like protein, protein shakes, post-exercise, post-training, that's going to help. It does other stuff too. Get it into your answers. Finally, guys, uh, we've got that fat consideration or the lipids. We've got energy insulation, cell fu function member. Uh, cell function is important with um, fats because, of course, cell membrane is fat-based. It's what's called a phospho uh, bile. Uh, it's a phospholipid bilayer. Let me get my terminology right. But also, we can use the glycerol and fatty acids. It's stored under the skin as subcutaneous fat. And as I said before, really good for low-intensity work, and it's energy-rich. Now, I do want to go on to some more micronutrients. I mentioned before that with our minerals, for example, uh, hemoglobin formed by iron, that goes on to form HbO2, oxyhemoglobin, but it can also form Hb. 
CO2. And answers on a postcard, if you know that's called, it's called carbamine hemoglobin. What a name. Anyway, really important for gas transportation. Phosphorus is used for muscle contraction. Calcium for bone growth. Um, and also notice this increased uh, density of bone in the bone matrix. That's actually an important skeletal adaptation. I think we might be talking about that later. I might, maybe I'm wrong. Vitamins, they're for health. Think about B12 for energy release. Vitamin C for immunity. I'm actually sitting here now with a vitamin D deficiency. This is no joke. I've worked so hard in the last bunch of years including like the lockdowns and stuff that i literally haven't had enough sun and i've got a vitamin d deficiency my goodness and uh, now then digestion i got in trouble on uh, youtube recently because someone told me that it doesn't in, it doesn't actually make you poo regularly um fiber nevertheless it's in your monster so i'm putting it in here but of course fiber is important for digestion particularly in the large intestine as you see there and it helps to the absorption of water so actually a really useful and water itself it maintains hydration i get it gets a bit embarrassing really i tell you what is important because if you don't have it you get dehydrated i mean i'm not sure what you meant to do with that um but it's really important for cell function think uh about your cyto uh, your cytoplasm you guys have studied that in lots of detail and your blood plasma these are formed from water of course so there you go now oh by the way i should stress to you folks if you wanted to look at ergogenic aids i did a whole section on ergogenic aids in my 2022 revision session that's on youtube it's on the website it's completely available to you so go and get your stuff go and get yourself um invested in that if that would help you now energy intake very basics so let's get this straight we are arguing that on average uh, with a million exceptions 2,000 kilocalories for females is the recommended or average daily intake of calories. Now, we are also arguing that for males, it would be in the region of 2,500 kilocalories uh, for males. Okay. Now, of course, as I said before, lots and lots of exceptions. But the really key point I want to get is I want to say it's big up arrow, far greater for athletes. Athletes who are training regularly, especially prof athlete, professional athletes, these numbers need to go way higher than this. So look out for that. And that, of course, is all based around the single principle, which is on my very next canvas. Pause there and I'll come straight back to you. You see, I told you I'll be straight back. Look out in your exam this year for tabular or table-based data around what I'm gonna show you here, okay? And now again, it's a real simple concept, but let's have a think about this. If an individual wants to maintain weight, and notice we are talking about over time, not necessarily in a daily period, their energy intake, let's say over a month, must equal their energy expenditure. Now, en energy expenditure, let's say I'm male, so let's say for me it's 2,500 kilocalories, plus exercise requirement. Okay, so what we mean by that, of course, is that if I'm very active and going to the gym every day and walking for part of my job, which I don't, which is really irritating. But anyway, if I was doing all of those things, of course, this figure is going to be greater because my energy intake will need to meet a greater energy expenditure. But of course, what we find in lots of people as they sort of get, I'm 46, by the way, so this has happened to me, is that our energy intake either stabilizes or go up. We get a bit greedy, I think, in my opinion. I'm probably way more than I used to. Um, but our energy expenditure, our activity levels drop because we're doing less and less of this. So, of course, this causes a gain in weight. And I'm not going to talk any more about myself. It's so depressing. Oh, God, I was so fit 10 years ago. Anyway, let's not go down that road. But losing weight, of course, is the opposite relationship. And that is to say, oh, by the way, just to, I know you know this, but this is the greater than sign. So the greater is the energy intake here. In this case, losing weight, energy intake, of course, is lesser. This could be because someone's dieting, for example. Uh, it could be because there's less, uh, fewer resources around. Um, it could be that, you know, they're doing an ultra marathon and they just can't get an, uh, as much energy on board. But our energy expenditure, if that goes up, okay, so for example, we're exercising more, this is going to mean that our weight over time decreases. Now, just on a health level, can I be saying to you th things like over a month? over six months we are not saying that anyone should be concerned that on their birthday they have a ton of cake and don't go gym right there's no problem with that it's completely normal it's the generalization yes and we are talking about strength training adaptations folks i'm not going to talk a great deal about this because ultimately everything you need is on the screen but of course one of the one of the um, terminologies we really want to get grips with is adaptation remember this is long term training effects okay long-term 
training effect. So this is not what happens during exercise, it's what happens as a result of exercise over time, you know, being part of a football team, being, I think, what, Julie, international netball player and training three times a week, whatever she's doing, you know, uh, being, uh, yeah, as an example. Now, one of the key things that I want you to stress here, folks, is I've separated these strength adaptations into metabolic, muscular and connective and neural adaptations. Notice we are not getting CV. Notice we are not getting respiratory. Notice we are not getting, uh, yeah, those things. Why? Because those are aerobic adaptation. Now, one interesting thing is strength-based training. Let's say HIIT training, interval training. They do develop these, but it's during the recovery from the exercise in between the sets. Anyway, let's go through this. Metabolic, all of the chemical reactions in the body. What happens? Well, those chemical reactions become more abundant because we increase our glycogen stores in the muscle and liver. More PC in the in the sarcoplasm so we can uh, we can maintain intensity for longer. More ATP, so we've got more explosive energy. Increased duration of the ATP PC system, that which I just said. It, it increased output of the glycolytic system when training for strength and endurance. So if we do high reps, low weight strength training for strength and endurance, we also get a big improvement in our lactic acid system. Now let's take this further. Our muscle and connective tissue we get a greater proportion of fast glycolytic type 2B fibers. The muscle cross-sectional area becomes bigger. Why? Because the muscle hypertrophy is why? Because it's storing all this stuff so it swells, right? If it's going to store all that, it's got to go somewhere. Increased force production, fantastic. More force, more strength. Increased strength of tendons. Remember, tendons transmit force, folks. So if the muscle gets stronger, the tendon has to get stronger and the sheath surrounding both the do you, just to just to reiterate a point, folks, here's my tendon and here's my muscle, which is, you know, imagine this is my muscle here. It looks a bit like my um, capillary bed, doesn't it? There's my muscle going off like that. There's my muscle. Okay, just be aware that both the muscle and the tendon are surrounded by the same sheath tissue. So, of course, this sheath tissue needs to be nice and strong. If this muscle gets stronger, the sheath tissue needs to be nice and strong. Therefore, the tens can transmit more force. Increased speed of, tra of uh, contraction, especially if we're doing plyometrics. Ligaments become more robust because they've got to undertake more stress. Uh, of course, they develop stability at the joints. And our muscle strength throughout the range. So, if we are doing, if we are, <laughs> what am I drawing? If we are doing, if we are, <laughs> if we are doing, what? believe it or not, that's a chest. Uh, chest press if we are doing a chest press we are getting strength in the whole rom so increased strength in that whole range of motion i've no idea what i just drew and finally folks neural adaptations we've got increased speed of nerve transmission brilliant and the coordination of pairs let's say the bicep femoris and the rectus femoris let's say uh the, the, let's say the tibialis anterior and the gastrocnemius the coordination of those pairs increases brilliant isn't strength training good Okay, super quick break. What is the aim of periodization? First of all, it's to include your A properly. The aim is to reach peak fitness, therefore performance at the appropriate moment in a training cycle. So periodization is all about peak fitness at the right moment. Think about your big competition, your Olympics, your big swim, your big gala, big race, whatever it happens to be. So I made this image especially for you. And yes, that is a Jason and Kylie quote for those who are old enough. So let's have a look what we've got here. This whole unit, the red bit, folks, we call the macro cycle. You'll know this, I think. What could it mean? It could be a whole training year. So by the way, I say the word year funny. People tell me all the time. Whole training year. How, how, which one is it meant to be? Great? Anyway, whole training year. But also, it could be two years. Think about someone who's going through world championships, then Olympics two years later, then two world championships, then Olympics. You know, football is the same. Um, you, you get that sort of big competition in the summer, right? Or every two summers. It can be a two to four year cycle, as we just said. And always it's based on an outcome goal. So this could be medal. This could be reaching a squad, you know, making the first team. This could be getting a contract. This could be getting on podium or podium potential if you're an athlete or a swimmer uh, trying to get to the Olympics. That is the aim, folks, and it's the overall aim. Now, what we're going to do with that training uh, cycle, the whole macro cycle, we're going to break it down into meso cycles. Now, it says here in the region of six weeks, but this is highly variable depending on people's structures and it relates to specific training goals normally in relation to a fitness test so notice these yellow blocks are macro cycles broken down into our case into six these would be eight week or two month blocks right so 
generally that period. But each one is broken down into a micro cycle. And that is one week here, one week of training, one week of training, one week. So we have got six lots of six weeks. Now, of course, um, that equals 36 weeks, obviously. Oh, sorry, six weeks of eight, which include, which means 48 weeks, doesn't it? Or is it, well, oh, I think it's 48, but I might be wrong. I think it is. Um, anyway, what we're saying is each of these microcycles is a training uh, week. And it's made up of training units. So imagine, for example, this one is quite likely this week here will have one, two, three, four, five, six training units within it. So we could go further and talk about what's inside a training unit, right? Each individual session, because each of those green blocks is a week. Now, we also have our phase of the season. Now, this is a massive generalization. We're going to talk about a preparatory phase. We're going to talk about a competitive phase, competitive phase. And we are also going to talk here about the transition phase or the closed season. Okay, so that language is really useful for us to learn. And I'm going to add a few notes to this just so we've got some key information. For our preparatory phase, okay, we're saying 6 to 12 weeks before the start of the season, June and July for a football club. But here we're talking about things like general conditioning. Think about your pre-season, general conditioning. We are talking here about aerobic work. We are talking here about strength work. We are talking here about mobility work. That's what we would expect to be seeing in a pre-season preparatory phase. But also, we get lots of skills being worked on, drills being coming to play for the sort of the, 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 the tactical side, and we get sports-specific training. Now, in our competitive phase, we get a different series of things. And I really want you to think about this. You've got it here. You've got perform recover train taper that is the competitive phase now i'm thinking about what sports are at the moment it's all the whatever champions league or premier league or wsl or whatever it is you're interested in you probably hear this commentary right they perform they're then going to recovery they then train for the next game and then they taper and tape by the way taper is bringing the quantity of training down prior to competition and the transition phase often known as closed season four to six weeks at the end of the season active rest recuperation and recovery and what we tend to find that people do is low intensity work low intensity work and we tend to find they do lots of aerobic work okay so yes they're resting but they're sort of ticking over and keeping themselves fit now folks re rehabilitation from injury here what can i say blinking well learning I, I don't know what else i can say really i've tried my absolute best to give you the most fundamental information there what i want to sort of draw out from this treatment of injuries and rehabilitation is just a couple of things i just want to emphasize the importance of cold all over this you will see that cold is there cold is there cold and hot cold you know there's loads of examples you know things like cryotherapy ice pack ice bath etc 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 okay this is how we would treat my injuries i just wanted you to be clear about what that cold does so whichever methodology we're looking at then you've got all the details above cold therapies often are included you will put an ice pack on loads of times i reckon so what does this do a cold therapy so you know let's talk about an ice bath for example it pushes it pushes Q, which of course we know as cardiac output, to the center of the body. Okay. In other words, it distributes blood away from the injured area. Let's say your ankle's injured. Okay. You've got a, you've got a, uh, you've got a ligament sprain. Now, what that's going to do then? It's going to decrease inflammation. But also, once you come back into normal temperature or even into warm water or, or hot therapy, what that's gonna mean is then the injured area is then flushed. And of course, what it's flushed with is oxygenated blood because once we come back into room temperature or we go into warm water, that injured area is flushed again with um, oxygenated blood. So just notice hot and cold treatment. Just notice, for example, all over this we've got ice here just notice we've got ice here just notice we've got ice here etc 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 these are really important principles and sit all over this having said all that folks learn the blinking table in it right because at the end of the day i can read it out to you but what's the point get on with it all right we're going to move on to biomechanics super quick break straight back
So we're into our third mini section for paper one to our biomechanics, of course. And I'm jumping past all of that stuff in Newton's laws. I'm jumping past levers. I'm jumping past technology and limb kinematics and all that stuff. Get it revised, yeah? And we're going to get to linear motion. Define it first. All parts of a body move in a straight line or a curve in one direction, same time, same speed. Now, I want to dwell on this. If it's something like a shot which is being putted... That thing is leaving the hand here and landing on the floor here and it's moving in an arc. It doesn't look like it's going in a straight line, but that would go in a straight line if it wasn't for the force of gravity. Okay, oh well, um, yeah, it wasn't for its mass multiplied by gravity which brings down to an arc. So that is what we mean by a curve, okay? Linear motion happens that way. If that same shot, if I was drawing it like this, if that was rotating backwards on itself because um, the thrower had done some kind of backspin, rolled off their fingers, then of course it would be moving with angular motion. This isn't. This is flying without spin, therefore. Now, we want to be clear about this. Linear motion happens because an object is struck, in this case golf ball, with force, and, it's th and it, in this case it's through the centre of mass, so through the con, and that makes it a direct force. Remind yourself that a body which is uh, which has its force applied away from the, uh, the central mass. So, for example, imagine a situation where this person uh, struck the ball sort of through that angle there. Okay, this ball would rotate back on itself through a backspin. Now, that is actually used in golf for all kinds of things. Um, but this direct force is through the centre of mass. The opposite, just to put it up here, away from the centre of mass, is an eccentric force. And an eccentric force creates, of course, rotation or what we call angular motion. We're not going to look at that much today. So, let's go down here. We have got a table of all the formulae and definitions that we need to use. And can I be clear for you, is absolutely possible you'll be asked to define, to give a formula, to give the unit of measurement. Can I also state, is also possible that you could be asked to calculate. So for goodness sake, don't be afraid of that. These are some of the simplest equations. You guys have done GCC physics, you've done math, GCC maths, you're doing whatever other course you're doing right now. You can do these formulae. These are not difficult. So I've tried to make that as discreet and as distinct for you as I can, okay? The one thing I want to draw out from you in that table is the distance, for, uh, the, the distance, the difference, for example, between distance and displacement. You'll notice distance is the length of path covered from start to finish, from position A to B. It's speed times time. It's in meters. Now, displacement is a very similar concept. It's the shortest stri straight line route from start to finish, from position A to position B. So, in other words, it's velocity times time. It's meters in a specific direction. So just to clarify that, folks, if we were looking at, I don't know, London Marathon course, and I don't know the London Marathon course, but it might be the London Marathon course is like this, for example. You know, it's like that. that you know, it isn't, but let's just say it is. Now, what this, so here's our start line and uh, here's our finish line. I don't know what I've done here. There's our start line and there's our finish line. Now, what our distance would be would be whatever this is here. Okay, this would be our distance, so let's call that 26.2 miles, or what is it, 42.2 kilometers. But the displacement would be this. Okay, it's the shortest path between the start and the finish. Don't know what that other loop was for, but anyway, you get the idea. So, those there are our equations and what have you. I want to leave those with you for you to study. Now, we are going to get into how we draw and illustrate motion through graphs, okay? So, what we've got first of all here is we have got a distance we have got a distance time graph and I'm just going to sort of pause talking here I want you to tell me or I want you to discuss or write down what you think is happening in that graph I'll give you sort of 10 seconds to do that hopefully you're thinking I'm sitting here wondering what to do with myself um, I'll start answering okay so what do we find here we find that this object its distance is remaining constant. This distance is neither going up nor down. So in other words, time is passing, but the distance is not changing. This object is still. Now, it's not still at zero. So we couldn't say a sprint start, for example. This could be, this could be, for example, let, let's say that uh, this was a sprint relay, and this distance here was... 400 meters 
okay that this this is 400 meters here and on the first change over the baton was dropped and the baton doesn't change distance it's on the floor everyone's crying no one can believe it that's what we would be looking at there so we just a couple of points there we could very easily apply newton's first law to that the object will remain at, at rest until anyway you get the idea but that is a still object not changing its distance what about this object we have got here time passing and we've got distance increasing proportionately. So I'll just pause for a few seconds, have a discussion or think about what is being illustrated by that curve. And what you should be saying to one another is that this is constant velocity. And I'm gonna give you a couple of examples. We had Josh, our sprinter. This is the middle of Josh's race. Now imagine Josh is sort of accelerated to top speed and let's say between 40 and 100 meters, he covers the same amount of distance per unit of time. This could be Kate, our triathlete, who is um, uh, who is going at a steady pace on her bike in the middle leg of the triathlon. This could be the ball that's left Julie, the netballer's hand, and is going from her hand to drop into the basket. And of course, it's going a, a standard uh, speed in this case is going at a constant velocity until it hits the you know the ring or the net or whatever let's go through things further now we're getting something a little bit more complicated what do we have here well the key thing to say here is um, the key thing to say here is that the rate of change of distance is increasing so here distance is changing that we are going up to here but the rate of it is slow. The rate of change of distance, look look how quick the change of distance is happening here. That is happening there, and it's ha that rate, of whatever that change of distance is. But the time from there to there is almost nothing, okay? We have got here acceleration. So could this be Josh in the sprint start on the first 20 meters? Maybe we're gonna come back to that point. Could this be uh, Tom striking a serve in the moments before the ball leaves the surface of the strings. Maybe this is acceleration on a distance time graph. And finally, of course, we get the inverse is the case for deceleration. That's what we've got here. The single C in deceleration always bothers me for some reason. I don't know if you're the same, but deceleration happening here. What can we say about this? The rate of change of distance, you know, it's a very fast rate of change of distance here, and it gets less and less and less and less. If we would carry on, we would be still, wouldn't we? The rate of change of distance becomes nothing. So this is Josh after the finish line. This is, let's go for, uh, let's go for Julie, let's use Julie. This is Julie as she receives a chess pass. Now folks, that's all nice and simple, but you need to be prepared to see more compound or collected versions of these graphs. Hence, we've got here. Now, I want you to note the most important word on this representation. We here, folks, have a distance time graph for an amateur sprinter. How do we know this is an amateur? In fact, I could ask you a question with multiple marks is, how would you know, how would you know this sprinter is amateur? Okay. Well, there's loads of things, right? First of all, they get to 100 meters at about here, about 90 seconds. So it's not a fast 100 meters, you know? Anything, I'm not gonna get into what it should be because it varies for every person. Second, so that's one thing, so it's a slow time. Secondly, look, they're still accelerating after eight seconds, so they accelerate slowly. Thirdly, their constant velocity period is very short. It lasts about, what, six sections, seconds, and then they fatigue. They decelerate. Now, we could give a reason for that. Their phosphocreatine, ATPPC, the, their A-lactacid system, has actually begun to fail. You know, it's begun to exhaust. Therefore, they decelerate. But that, of course, is an amateur sprinter for those reasons. Now, with that in mind, we've got a distance time graph, but we are using all of our knowledge of those upper curves there. Now, coming back to here, folks, this is what we might have for an elite sprinter. Now, notice the difference. First of all, they get to 100 meters in about 10 seconds. I'm not sure if you can do that. I definitely can't. And by the way, mine at best would look like this because, I mean, I intimated it earlier, didn't I? I'm not the athlete I once was. Perhaps you are. I don't know. 
But here, distant time graph from an elite sprinter. Notice what we've got here. They're accelerating far quickly. They're at their top speed here. That's what, just shy of uh, five seconds. Still feels quite long, doesn't it, for 100 meters? But think about the nature of the event. It does take quite a long time to get to full speed. Notice as well, that's only at about 30 meters. You know, they do the last 70 meters in about the five seconds, right? That's quite interesting, isn't it? Look, there's the first half of the race. There's the second half. You know, look at the difference. And of course, what we're getting here is then that they don't decelerate. There's not this kind of uh, dip away at the end of this. They go at constant velocity until the end. And of course, they've got, you know, effectively an elite level time. So really important that we can analyze distance time graphs like that. I'm going to change my canvas and we'll be straight back with the last couple of bits and bobs. So folks, to sort of to get this across, I want you to sort of take this task on. I'm asking you to sketch a 400 meter distance time graph for any of those three scenarios. One is running a consistent split time, one is running a fast 250, and then you know they're trying to hang on. That's sort of the Christine Oharugu sort of mentality. Unbelievable athlete, by the way, won the Olympics and World Championships, I think. Uh, and then the last one runs a steady, steady 250 and hits top speed for the last 150 meters. So what would a distance time graph look like for each of those? So do have a go at it. I'm just gonna sort of talk as you sort of get cracking with that. And obviously if you're doing this on demand, you can sort of skip to me doing it in a second if you want to. But when you're sketching your graph, make sure you are giving a title. Make sure you are providing axes. Make sure you are labeling those axes. Make sure you're putting your units for those. And once you're doing that, you could even use, at least for today, different colors to represent the different phases. Now, you're not gonna do that in your exam. You're gonna draw it probably with a black pen, aren't you? Um, but nevertheless, now, I've sort of banged on long enough, just waste time. I'm gonna put my Y axis in. I'm sketching, I'm put my X axis in, okay? There we go. I'm not going to put my title in because what I'm going to do is I'm going to assume I've got my title. I'm going for this one here. Uh, they run sort of steady for the first 250 and then they accelerate for the last 150. Now what I am going to do is I'm going to put my time on my X in seconds and I'm going to go from zero, oh, that meant to be a zero, to I'm going to say it takes my run of 55 seconds. For I won't put the other markers in and they're going to go from zero meters at the sprint start and they're going to obviously go to 400 meters up here. And of course this is distance in meters so i've done my sort of technical job try and get into good habits of doing that now i said i was going to do like the steady one to begin with and then the acceleration so i'll just use colors i mean you don't need to do that but we definitely have an acceleration phase so it's going to go like that my one's going to go steady so they're going to go a bit like this i haven't drawn this very well they're going to go like this and then for the last 150 i'll choose a different color they're going to accelerate so my curve, I don't know how well I've done it, it's going to look a bit like this, okay? So we've got an acceleration, what I meant to have as a constant velocity, and then we've got an acceleration at the end. Now I've gone for a sort of an elite time, so we're not going to get that dip off the end. Can I stress to you that if you went for the like the belting out of the park sort of first 250, you might have got something different. You might have got sort of like this kind of, uh, this kind of picture here. So much faster at this point, and then here, they're kind of hanging on, right? Here, they're kind of hanging on to get to the end. Now, can you see for me how interesting that makes the 400 meters? Because depending on how you do the tactics, who's going to get to that point there the fastest? And I think that's an, in personally, I think that's an interesting thing to do, um, just to sort of emphasize these points. Now, the other type of graph we need to be aware of is what we call a velocity time graph. Can I just stress to you that sometimes, rightly or wrongly, they still call these speed time graphs? So just be prepared for that in case you see it. If if you're given a speed time graph, in my mind, it is completely synonymous with a velocity time graph, meters per second. Okay, so that's what I want to say. So what's happening in our image here? Well, first things first, folks, our, our velocity is at this level and it is not changing. This is constant velocity. Now, of course, it's not a stationary object because the constant velocity is not zero. It's at whatever that figure is, whatever meters, you know, that might be 10 meters per second. That's how fast this is moving. So we can look out for that. Secondly, this object here, this is an accelerating body. So this is acceleration, okay? And the reason we know it's acceleration is the rate of change of velocity is increasing as time progresses. Therefore, an increased rate of change of velocity is literally the definition of, of acceleration. So that is an accelerating curve. This is Josh in the sprint start position. Oh, sorry, this is Josh in the first 30 meters. Now, here we get the rate of change of velocity 
decreasing we're getting now a vertical downward curve so of course what we've got here we have got deceleration okay so um, let's think about Laura our gymnast as she um, as she kind of uh, as she goes through her vault and as she strikes the mat on her landing she decelerates down to zero okay she goes down to zero velocity that's what we're talking about there and then finally guys this would be one that you really want to have a look out for this is what we describe as something like a change of direction or even a vertical jump uh, now a vertical jump would actually look slightly different but this is a change of direction folks okay so what are we finding here is that we're getting an acceleration and constant velocity up to a peak point so this is sort of moving sort of dodging maybe to the left then the person is now switching so this is them slowing down to a moment of stillness where they're starting to push back now they're pushing back to their right and this is them coming back to their start position here so imagine sort of someone doing a sort of a dodge to the left to the right and then staying still okay that's what we might be reflecting there we get a positive velocity and then a negative velocity so going in one direction and then going in another direction nothing to do with pop bands okay we're nearly there folks fluid mechanics first of all we need to have an awareness of the factors affecting air resistance or drag can i stress to you air resistance is what it says in the can it's the factors which affect you know the forces acting typically backwards uh, from something moving through the air or gas but of course drag is the equivalent thing in water so think about swimmer or boat or something like that okay so what affects air resistance first of all the velocity of the body think about our shuttlecock our shuttlecock has very very high air resistance why because it's going well fast okay it's got a very high velocity greater velocity greater air resistance in fact it's also factorial so as you get faster this air or this water actually gets stickier and stickier and grippier and grippier as you go through so fast moving objects are particularly influenced by air resistance secondly we've got mass okay a mass of an object is often related to the speed at which it's traveling the velocities which is traveling so if something has a low mass think shuttlecock again it will tend to have a high air resistance or really in comparison to its weight to high air resistance thirdly think about frontal cross-sectional area now i'm going to stick frontal cross-sectional area i'm going to stick with my shuttlecock here well if you look at a shuttlecock sort of nose on there's the sort of the cork of the shuttle of course it fans out here and, and i'm not very very it fans out there and there right this is actually if you were to actually that's actually that's not a very good drawing that's actually quite a big cross-sectional area for really what is a small object in other words the greater the frontal cross-sectional area think about a cyclist sitting up as they go down a mountainside no she would tuck and get nice small cross-sectional area now our cyclist other points we really want to be thinking as well about streamlining okay streamlining if we've got streamlined shape think about our cyclists think about our swimmer long and straight as they glide through the water streamlining reduces air resistance if it's streamlining or it's the right shape and finally folks we have got i'm going to choose a nice pink color here we have got surface characteristics and i'm going to go back to my shuttlecock there is he my shuttlecock now i didn't just draw a bad drone but this shuttlecock is made of glue and cork and feathers you know literally feathers from one is it the left wing of a particular type of goose i can't remember what it is but this has got a really rough set of characteristics so of course if it's rough we get more air resistance something like lycra tight fitting smooth uh, uh cycling outfit for example as kate might wear when she does leg two a cycling leg that of course is going to promote streamlining smooth surface characteristics and less air resistance folks we are on the last leg we are doing Bernoulli's downwards lift force weird term isn't it I am going to assume folks that you know what Bernoulli's principle is I've got a whole playlist on Bernoulli's principle so I am going to make that assumption I'm sorry if you really need someone to go over that with you but the main principle is that we have for a downforce we have an inverted aerofoil now what the hell does that mean so it means the following when our object travels through the air that should have a, 
I will show you that. When our object travels through the air, notice that the air passing over the object compared to the air passing under the object, above, it's got less distance to travel. And you might be thinking, well, how does it know where it's got to go? The key, the key sort of intuition here is remember that if this is an air molecule and this one is, and they end up here and here, it's actually our green object, our inverted aerofoil, which is moving past them. So the air is always going to end up in the same place because the object is moving with a, uni with a uniform velocity. So that's intuition. But we've got less distance above. We've got greater distance travelled by the air below. Okay, so what does that mean? That means that our air above is going to move faster and our air below is going to move faster. <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> what am I talking about? Our air above is going to move slower. Gordon Bennett. And our air below <laughs> is going to... I do understand it. Trust, I've talked this for years. It's going to move faster. Now, why is that important? It's important because slow-moving air develops to high pressure. Fast-moving air develops to low pressure, just like our concentration, gradient back diffusion, gas exchange earlier on. Air, uh, sorry, pressure acts from high to low, air moves from high to low, and we get a Bernoulli lift force downwards. What does this create? It creates downforce. So there's a couple of things to be aware of over here. Why is this important? Well, if we look at our cyclist here, you know, look at our cyclist body. What I could say, I'll try and draw this with red. Now, you got. I know you're going to challenge me on all kinds of stuff here. Just go with it, yeah? So if this air molecule comes along here, let's go back to what was shown here. This air molecule here has to go under. We'll go under and around him here. This one here just needs to go whoop, there. Can you see the air underneath has less distance to travel than the air above, right? So we get our Bernoulli principle. And if this person, first of all, I think this is frame actually, we're getting that lift force down. So first of all, it's creating greater friction between the wheel and the road, especially on the back wheel where the drive is happening, so that's good. But it also means they can turn corners at higher velocity without losing grip. So imagine uh, I mean, I've used a time trial image. It's probably not the best one actually to use. It's probably more of like a descending mountain style would work better. But because that's the case, they can turn corners without losing grip. Now, that is really important as well as something like uh, motor racing. I think this is a Formula One car. And especially where the, the circuits are twisty and turny. Excellent examples are the Monaco Grand Prix, for example, where it's like a road course and it's very twisty turning. You'll see really big back wings. Why? Because they are inverted aerofoils and they create downforce onto the back wing, pushing the car down so that it can turn the corners at high velocity. And that is the mechanism by which it does it. So, yes, I'm leaning on your knowledge of Bernoulli principle, but hopefully you've got that. Wow. I think I've overrun massively on time. Fair play if you're stuck in for the whole session. Hope it's been useful. Let's have a quick chat. Oof. Sweat to ears again, Marta. Yes. These things are, these things are killing me. <sighs> how was that? Nearly yeah. an hour. Well, how long was that? Hour 15? Hour 15. Absolute yeah. deep dive. A little while. Going to have on to uh, be big. quick here. Yeah, so uh, any questions or thoughts or I'm comments? Going to, I'm going to, to start with shout out so mm -hmm. that we make sure we've got them. Uh, first one to Whitman P, um, who sent a photo that, in. There, those guys on Twitter. On We've Twitter, yes. Great right. to see all the A level students re engaging with revision. We've also yep. got um, got a picture, a photo from students engaging in revision from Royal Wood Ambassador Academy in Wiltshire. Um, well, so really, I know. Really I know. Good to see. I know what ambassador a bit. I've played a lot of football around there. I used to live not too far from there, funnily yeah, enough. Yeah, it's uh, I was, so I was in Farringdon, not too far away, but I played in the Hellenic League West for quite a long time uh -huh. in my 20s and uh, played a number of times at uh, what ambassador. I always got beaten. Okay. Um, tough place to go. Anyway, there you go. Uh, also got a picture from King's College of students also deep in revision. Hello, King's really College. Really concentrating, looking mm -hmm. amazing. Couple of other shout outs. One to the mighty Arnwood Sixth Form. Uh, yes, Arnwood Sixth Form. Another one. Hello, um, Arnwood. 
to Hannah from those. Bay House Sixth Form. Ah, oh, Bay House down on the south coast. We love yeah. Bay House. Many a fixture played against Bay House second team. Well, I, I, Bay House is a um, is a school that I've played lots of football fixtures against as a teacher uh, when I was doing sixth form um, stuff. And, and also, um, yeah, and from the south to the north uh-huh. to Altswater Community College in Penrith. Oh, well, they're our favourite. So I'm a Cumbrian. <laughs> I'm a I'm a Cumbria lad. I was I grew up in Carlisle. Yeah, um, we were there just in October. We were just we? we were in Penrith. Yes, yeah, it was in October, Penrith. November. There's some yeah. photos online if you want to have a look of us. Was, where um, we were Randalls, what, wouldn't we? Uh, yeah, yes. down by well, Pooley well, yeah. Bridge that way, yeah. out that way. Really nice. We we love Penrith, don't we? Yeah. Really, really like Penrith. Anyway, so enjoying they're enjoying revision with a bit of pizza and snacks. And I do hope I know they were having a bit of an issue with um, audio oh. levels. I do hope that that's oh. been sorted. Oh, sorry about that. Um, but I, nonetheless, I hope that you've been able to um, yeah to to enjoy the revision. Fantastic. Thank you guys for engaging. Really appreciate it. And then a few questions for you, James. Please, yeah. First of all. First question, why can't you say quadriceps? Uh, quadriceps, no, you, you do actually need to name uh, typically one of the four quadriceps muscles. So to remind you, I've got to check myself, rectus femoris, and then the three vastus muscles, the lateralis, the medialis, and what am I missing, the intermedius. So yes, you do need to say those. Unless something has changed, quadriceps will not get you the mark. If it, I mean, if someone correct me if I'm wrong, but I'm very sure that's not the case. Mm-hmm. Okay. Mm, second question can you please explain the difference between skeletal muscle pump and mm-hmm. smooth muscle pump okay so these are so first of all we've got the skeletal muscle pump and then we've got smooth muscle that's the language we need to use. so just to differentiate these are both venous return mechanisms Ske- skeletal muscle pump works because veins if that's a vein it passes it passes up and through skeletal muscle like the gastrocnemius so when you're running say in your hockey match your uh, gastrocnemius is contracting, relaxing, contracting, relaxing. So it's effectively squeezing that blood up. Now, meanwhile, that's the skeletal muscle pump. Now, meanwhile, smooth muscles surrounding uh, venules and veins, what they do is they affect, let me do it this way, they effectively sort of pulse like this. So imagine a vein trying to get blood back up to the heart. And of course, the heart is beating and relaxing, beating and relaxing, systole, diastole. So what this thing does, it goes doop, doop and squishes the blood back itself. And that's called an increasing vasomotor tone, a decreasing vasomotor tone, an increasing vasomotor tone, a decreasing vasomotor tone. You can call it, of course, vasoconstriction, vasodilation. That's what's happening there. Okay, fantastic. Uh, then if I can take you back to almost basically the beginning of, this, of the session, mm-hmm. when you were talking about the box jump, there's that uh, picture of that, uh, I think it was a... a, a plyometric a, a exercise, yeah. box jump. Yeah. A question came in, why is the agonist the gluteus maximus and not the iliopsoas? Okay, so assuming the person is still in the downward motion, that's the key point from that question. It was a tough question, about as tough as you can get actually, assuming they were still sort of going down into that tuck, what's happening there is it's flexion at the hip. Now we all know flexion at the hip is normally powered by the hip flexors. The iliopsoas, those are made up of the iliacus and the psoas muscles, right? So that's normally the case. But because this is still going downwards, it's actually the muscle, the gluteus maximus, which is contracting and lengthening under tension and acting as a break. That is why it's the agonist. The uh, iliopsoas would be the antagonist in this case, as it's not doing anything. It's it's relaxing. So yes, that's why. Amazing. And also, also towards the early part, when you were talking about the redistribution of blood, mm-hmm. why does uh, Q return to 20% during recovery? Shouldn't it remain elevated until you reach resting? That is a really great point. I don't remember exactly how I said it, but absolutely, that is a process. So I'm sort of looking at black and white numbers there, right? It, it's it's at 20, then it goes to 80 during exercise, and it goes back to 20. No, this is gradual. Once we stop exercise, and especially if we do sort of like an active cool down, that 80% distribution of blood to the muscle will gradually go down to that 20. The 20 litres of cardiac output will gradually go down to, let's say, 5 litres. So you're absolutely right. It is a gradual thing. And, of course, there's a benefit to maintaining it a little bit higher because then we can flush the blood with, uh, flush the muscle with oxygenated blood through that process. So absolutely, that's the point. So it's definitely a process. Happen over time. If you just stop, it will happen faster. If you maintain an active cool down, it will happen a bit more gradually. And that's a positive thing. Mm-hmm. Perfect. And that's it in terms of questions. I just have one last shout out from yeah. Harriet, who said uh, thank you, how useful this has been, and she's looking forward well, to the next uh, sessions. Uh, 
Harry, that's... Sorry. No, go, go, go. I was going to say, we probably also got a shout-out of our own, Well, I'm going to do one last one. But first of all, I've just seen on Twitter, Joey Warren, the tweet of the day, loving your hair today, James. Let me know your routine. I mean, goodness me, Joey. I think you may be mocking me slightly. I mean, routine, Jesus. Um, Get up. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's that in it. That's the routine. I don't know what to say. Thank you, Joey, for recognising. Do you know what? When I was in year 11 at my school, this is in uh, when I was up north, obviously, um, I actually won Hair of the Year Award. Was it the bit of Farrah Fawcett spray? I was a big... What's that geezer out of Stranger Things? Is Steve... Yeah, what's his Steve name? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, had a massive that. quiff. So, yeah, I mean, this is what you've got to look forward to, you boys. <laughs> So yeah, enjoy yourselves while it's young, mocking me, you buggers. Anyway, we must make a final shout out. And we have a very special student who may or may not be taking the session. And she's asked us to make a shout out. Her name is Anna S. She attends Farnborough Sixth Form College. And she wants to make a shout out to Emma, she wants to Carly, to all the PE students. And she's left a really spurious <laughs> note, which is, what's for dinner, Dad? I don't know what the answer to that is. But Anna S., we wanted to make a shout out to you. You've managed to keep yourself secret in that P group for far too long. And um, thank you for letting us give you a shout out. Amazing. Good stuff. All right. Marta, we are literally on AQA yep. in yep. six minutes, so we need to go. Is there anything burning or no, sensational? Nothing. We need to go. Guys, I, I, am, so. I am going to put a tiny bit of music on to finish, but this will be seconds because we are literally due on another stream to do another hour and a half of AQA. So forgive me if the music doesn't play very long, doesn't get your time to get out the door. You know what it's all about. Um, cheers, folks. Yeah, we really appreciate you. Anything at all, just give us a shout. Have a great evening. Enjoy what's tonight into AC in it. Let's go enjoy that. Cheers. Thank you.